All right, Leslie, thank you so much for being here as my friend and my spiritual guru expert. <laughs> um, you know that I run a women's group called Healing Heart, and every month we focus on a topic. And I'm often surprised by what comes up in the topic. <laughs> and last month we picked abundance. And I thought this was going to be a fun, you know, like just like think about the things you want to bring into your life and get tapped into uh, the, the bigger, you know, source of goodness in the world. But the first night that we talked about it, we, we just always have an open discussion and really pull on the collective wisdom of the group. And I was really surprised by the direction that it went. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this is a, a good place to start with you. Um, first of all, I was thinking abundance is a very positive idea. Mm -hmm. And yet the group, um, definitely part of the opinions were about negative things like how we can have too much overwhelm too much anxiety and abundance of anxiety interesting like mind blown like didn't really think of it that way um and just also the idea somebody was tying it into um if you have a lot of abundance here then you probably have a lack of something over here that that it might be intrinsically tied to like a lot here and a little here so what are your, do you have initial thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. It's really fun to just, you know, all the ways that we play in our relationship together. And this is really a uh, fun work for me too. So I'm glad to be here with you. And I'm also a little surprised that it, with the group that it went this way. I mean, I thought that's the part of the genius of groups of like bring something up that needs to be worked out. The thing that's sparkling for me the most is that, you know, in my work, we sort of often talk about when we're distilling things down to the spiritual nature of reality, for a lack of a better term, there really are only these two paths. And that's going to seem oversimplified, but I think it'll help us sort of gateway into this idea and explain the things that come up for people when they start to think about abundance, is that there's only two paths. So if we had to call those, um, you know, the, the way of the mind, which is saying, my conscious thoughts. So this like society exists at the level of the mind and inherent in the mind stuff is this idea of separation, which means I'm writing it down because that's the way my brain thinks. So I'm making myself a diagram there <laughs> win lose. Mm -hmm. There is, um, you know, scarcity, like I have to get mine and getting mine means that you can't get yours. And only one of us wins back to that win lose separation fight. And this, like, I'm always under attack. So I always have to defend myself. Mm -hmm. And if we have to defend ourselves, that means we're inherently vulnerable. So that's sort of like one path perspective, which is like the way of the mind. And then there spiritually is more of what I would call the way of the heart or the way of embodiment or the way of love. This says that actually there is some kind of unity that ultimately we are all connected and part of this mystery of life that appears in different forms there is only really win-win solutions that by me building you up i also benefit so that takes off the plate you know attack and defense or needing to push you down in order for me to get higher and instead of scarcity, this is true level abundance. So it sounds like what people were talking about was sort of still stuck on this scarcity mind path, but trying to think about abundance from that side versus this actual other unity heart type of perspective. And when we sort of understand the nature of who we really are, which is the question that most of us use spiritual traditions to answer, if you come from that place of, unity that also at the depth and you having done my body wisdom academy training we talk about the layers of the human being that humans this definition of being a human being at our center we really are the spark of the divine we are that great mystery we are inherently worthy and love with a capital l whether you call that god in the universe and from that perspective of course there's no question about whether you deserve abundance or not and there's no need for you to defend because you are beyond needing defenses. So I don't know if that was too big, too fast, but those, you know, I think when we look at it from those two perspectives, it sort of starts to see where we can get caught and where we're actually coming from. 
no, this is great. And I want to fill you in on kind of what happened next because it yeah. is so in line with what you're saying. So, um, after I went home that night and I really had this mind split of like, I thought it was going to be this way. It right. went this way. Um, I started to come up with an hypothesis. And again, I have worked with you. I've talked to you a lot about these things. And I, I came back to the ladies and I said, this is my working hypothesis that the definition that we originally came up with or the, the way we were talking about it in group was sort of like the worldly experience of abundance yeah. where having a lot of money means you might be greedy, you know, or that you have you're taking away from somebody else. Yeah. And I said that we needed to raise our awareness up to like the cosmic level to understand abundance. And it was so cool because one person's painting, her name's Linda. She painted this really cool spirally cloud thing. And I remember saying you, she like took abundance out of this world. And so mm. we really talk about that difference of like abundance at the cosmic level versus abundance on the earthly plane. Yes. And the part I really struggled to explain was how does abundance work when there is a finite amount of things in the earth? Like there is only so much food or I only have so much energy. Like I really had trouble explaining how they work together. Yes. <laughs> so can you do that? Yes. So that's, that's really beautiful. And that's like the question, that's really the difficulty. And what we see is as we progress on our personal and spiritual path, we start to hear these things about sort of like the heart love path that we are all created, that there is enough, that bun abundance does really exist, but yet we have this emotional and in this lifetime experience of shipping hard and losing and all of these things. So really, I would say part of my work and your work and part of the, you know, mystical path of really understanding is how to know that this is true know that the, my working hypothesis of the love is real and there is really divinity and magic flowing everywhere and it still appears like this. So I think at its best, the analogy that helps me the most, one of my spiritual teachers once said, you know, life is like a video game. The video game is this mind level of reality. We are trying to play the video game in a way that wins. We want Super Mario to get to the next level. You know, I'm a child of the 80s. There was all these like time that we spent playing video games and trying to figure out the rules and where the hidden stuff was to get to the next level. But while we're playing that game, we never forget that it's actually a game that we're playing, that it's not the truth of who we are. If I lose that level, yeah. Right, the saying is to be in the world in the world but not of the world this is what that phrase means i'm in the world and i'm playing that game but that's not my true identity what i really know and the the motivation and the place where i you've heard me say plant my flag is that this is true and i try to bring that into the way that i act in the world that is where we start to get these higher level or you know if we can go higher expanded levels of what abundance really means and it also feels like, isn't it paradoxical in a way that I'm just kind of holding these two really different experiences of like, I believe that we're really all connected in one in love. And I know that people are starving and somehow I just yes. hold them both. It's only paradoxical, uh, paradoxical if we believe the mind. The okay. mind always lies. And it's <laughs> the mind lies that, that keep us confused. So the mind will say the exact opposite of what is true. The mind will say, oh, in order to get what you need, you have to hold on to this tightly. When the truth is the exact opposite is true. To really get what you need, often we need to let it go and then find that we receive it more. That is a bold statement right there. Wow. The mind always lies. I really like that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> because remember we're we're choosing one of these two paths the whole challenge is that you cannot do both you cannot say yes we're all one but when it comes to my landlord you know <laughs> she's a crap head and i need to do all these things and you know work against it that doesn't mean that we're not skillful i'm going currently through a landlord dispute with the place i just moved out of so that's really real for me in that moment but you know, we can do any number of skillful things on this side for becoming more 
skillful in the way that we play the video game of the world. These are the things, you know, like you and I have talked a lot about business and creativity. And so there's people who can have all these ideas and they're doing vision boards and other stuff. But if they never learn the in the rules of the game of life, get it together stuff, they're not going to manifest it and make it real. Hmm. So it's really getting skillful in both of those ways. Okay, let me see if I've got it. So I want to choose the path of really believing and living that we are all love and all connected. But I also want to have skills to play the game of life so that it's what fun and <laughs> enjoyable. Well, I'm not sure why, but I want those too. <laughs> right. Okay. Those? Yeah. So let's talk about what are the things that connect these two paths that help us deprogram our mind thinking and help us to be more clear on this heartfelt way. One of the ways, and I know you teach this is to use, to be dropping into the body and to really, in terms of manifesting, really feel in your embodied sense in a somatic way that what you are yearning for is actually already here and you're experiencing it. Mm -hmm. Because that's a link. I want it in this physical world. So remember that life is coming from me, not at me. So the biggest mind shift that I would ask people to make around abundance is to make the mind shift that what I currently experience in my outer world is a reflection of the state of my inner world. I believe, Do yep, it again. I believe you can't really get to abundance unless you wholeheartedly work, accept that what is showing up in your outer world, whether that's the state of your relationships, the state of your bank account, your relationship with money, how happy you think you are, or how well things are going for you in life. The state of your outer life is a direct reflection of your inner world. If your inner world is in chaos, your outer world will look chaotic. If your inner world is filled with unconscious beliefs about not deserving, about what hard work really means, about who and what have money and what that means about them as people and how they get love or not is going to be shown to you in your situations in the outer world. And this, I feel like, goes brings me to the to the road that you and I have often talked about. Well, what if I just think all positive thoughts then? Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm just not going to think those things and then I will have abundance, right? Right. That is the new agey bullshit that people come up with based on this half sort of truth. So the key that we haven't talked about yet, which as you know, is my specialty is the subtle body. So the subtle body, which is a combination of your conscious, unconscious, and energetic layers of yourself. So as an acupuncturist, I've studied the meridians and the subtle energy system. If there is that block in your system, if you're holding a pattern, patterns that we get are more than just mental thoughts. So you can't just change your thinking and change your inner world. The state of your inner world is a combination of three things. Your unconscious thoughts, the actually way that energy moves in your system, and the essence of your mind-body connection. So a lot of people talk about the mind-body connection, but not many people have a, a real technical understanding of what that means. So it, your inner world has to be clear on all of those levels, free from unconscious blocks, held beliefs about yourself, to in order to really have that free flow between inner world and outer world abundance. Yeah. And why don't you drive it home a little bit more now in the positive, like knowing that that's what my inner world is really made yes. of. How do I work with abundance from inside to get it in the yes. outside? Yes. Good question. Thank you. So one of the ways to start is to really get clear on, you know, what you want and what your heart's desire is, is always a good place to start. So, and in the wonderful context, like you have of a group of heartfelt women doing this work together, there's no better place because when I write out my list of what I really want for myself and I read it to other people, 
I'm going to get immediate feedback when people are going to call me out lovingly on like, well, it sounds like you're selling yourself short. Or are you sure that's you know, like, I've heard you say you really wanted this, but you didn't list that. So right away, making a list and being seen by other people will start to show you where you might have some unconscious blind spots on the inside. So I think once you've made that list of where things are, then you can start to bring out what the deeper issues are. So it's kind of like go digging for the yes. things in your way. Yep. You, re you re-engineer it. If I know my outer world, it reflects my inner world. I can start with noticing what's crappy on my outer world and kind of work in that backwards and being like, huh, I can use my own example of, uh, especially with men, working out relationships with men has been a, one of the toughest biggest blind spot things that I have worked on in this lifetime. And so I started to notice maybe like four or five, six years ago when I started really dating as a practice, I had had a, broken off a really difficult long relationship that just stripped me down to really a difficult place in my life, rock bottom in terms of relationships with men. My finances were in shambles. I was trying to run a business by myself. Um, and so when I finally came back to the place where I was turning towards it and I started going on dates, I noticed that I seemed to be attracting men who had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Now, no one in my family really drinks a lot, um, but it showed up in two or three guys where like, you know, second, third date, dropped me off at my house, hung out for a little while, went right to the fridge and found like the one bottle of beer in the back of the fridge that like, you know, had been there for eight months. There were some other incidences. But when I finally paused later and started doing the work, I realized that on the inside, I uncovered a belief that I didn't really deserve to have a man in my life who was really there for me. Mm -hmm. And when I did the healing work on that belief and sort of felt it, you know, shift and move through almost immediately, like it was, it still shocks me to this day to like the quality of men that I started attracting in the next three to four months after that were a whole nother echelon of dudes, a great Airbnb guy who wasn't a romantic person, but just was like an upstanding guy who took care of his family and, you know, paid for things, gave me good advice about men. Another, you know, super had a similar spiritual path, guy who was really into like heartfelt connection, just like a different level of men showing up in my life because I changed and got rid of the things in my inner life. So my outer life started to change. Yeah, this is a really big idea. The last thing, maybe it's the last thing that I want to touch on is abundance and deservingness because mm -hmm. as we were talking, I know that that was in the room that it's just hard for us in our culture of scarcity to really connect to deservingness. Yeah. And so that, you know, what you were saying, like my list, maybe I'm not giving myself enough credit or allowing my wants to be big enough. Like that was totally in the room with us. So yeah. what, can you, what can you say about that? I'm going to give you the extra credit straight path because that's just how we roll. Some people are going to be ready for it. Some people won't. But if you're willing for the shortcut extra credit route, the question that we ask is, who am I? It's a spiritual level question. Who and what am I? Am I Leslie in this physical body? Or am I something different that I answer from my spiritual connection? In this moment, if you stop thinking for just a second, everyone can try this in this moment, just notice that now or even throughout the day, you can notice that just for a moment you stop thinking. And it won't be long because the mind is very active and it will come back to things, but you probably noticed that there was at least a split second where you weren't thinking anything, but you were still aware. Would you say that that's true? Yes. So what's important for people to start to answer this question, especially if you don't have a particular spiritual tradition, I would offer up that the true part of who you actually are is that awareness that is always there. You are not actually Michelle. You are really, when it comes down to it, you are awareness, having an experience 
through this sort of ego person that looks and acts and says she's Michelle. You'll notice this in children. When your daughter talks about herself, how does she call herself? Does she say, I want that at this point when she's in her two or three? And want that. Yeah. She talks about herself in the third person. She is still more connected to the awareness acting Mm. out through this cute little robot, which we call M. (laughs) And it's that mystery of that awareness. It's the part of ourselves to which nothing has ever happened that is aligned with the path of love that is our true nature. When we answer who we really are, it gets us closer at least to the working hypothesis for our inherent abundance. No one questions if a child deserves love. If people, if you have trouble with this concept, think about a baby. Mm. You see a beautiful baby. The baby does not do anything. It does not make an income. It (laughs) cries. It poops. It requires cleanup and feeding and maintenance to perhaps the highest level that there is. And yet, No one questions the worthiness of this infant. Somewhere between infant age and our adulthood, we lose the awareness that we are still that child. And so if we can bring ourselves back to our inherent worthiness, whether it's as a child or answering it with that spiritual shortcut question, we start to really see Cut, we sort of connect in with our true nature and we start to see some of the things that are in the way. Mm. And that's the place that I want to think about my deservingness, what I truly want in this life. And that's where abundance lives as well. Yeah. That, right. Because if mm. you're, if that's true, if we are all one, if it's love, it's, if you're just a magnificent part of awareness in the universe, there's, there's nothing that you don't deserve. There might be a different game or technique you need to play in order for your energy to match up with that in the physical world, but it's not a question of deserving. Okay. I know, I know where we got to go next then. I want you to at least touch upon the fact that people do suffer in this life because when we allow ourselves to think that we're all one and love and deserving, it's hard to believe it's true when I know that people are suffering. So yep. Really good question. So the question is sort of like, you know, why do good things happen to bad people? Why are things difficult? I know that as a, you know, spiritual advisor, healthcare practitioner, I've talked with many people who have gone through very difficult life situations. And many people, let's just take cancer, for example, we both have a mutual friend who's going through some pretty serious cancer that may cause her to lose her life. And one of the things that we've both heard her say, in several different ways is, wow, I'm so grateful. I really see things from a different perspective. And this is true in my experience with most people who've gone through cancer or a really difficult thing, even a difficult relationship. We can see that even when difficult, life-threatening, really hard things happen, that there is real learning and gifts that come from those experiences, even though we wouldn't have chosen them off a list of 10 (laughs) things. And so that's sometimes a a close way to get in and answer those questions that everything, I have a personal belief and working hypothesis that everything is arising for my benefit without exception. Whether I come across difficult people, whether I have a landlord that's, you know, trying to, trying to get more and more money out of us in an unfair way. You know, I can learn to play this game, but I recognize in my deeper and inner world that everything is coming up in some way for me to learn and to grow and for me to move towards wholeness. Hmm. And it does, it really helps me to zoom out to that higher cosmic perspective where I see that I have multiple lives and, you know, it just, 
it can it can help make it a little more manageable to understand i think right <laughs> yes and even in those moments you know part of part of spiritual and personal growth is learning how to direct and focus the mind because even though we shouldn't lead with our minds we should really lead with our embodied experience heart hips pelvis we still need to train the mind so instead of what most of us do when we're stuck in the mind path is we the mind will automatically because it's always lying is focusing on the one exception that seemed true that was the bad thing and then just focuses on that. Well, that's not going to work. Well, I tried it that one time. Well, what about what happened to Susan? Blah, 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 blah. And just focuses there. Instead of taking the mind and moving it towards, you know, even in the midst of that terrible thing happening, I felt a peacefulness. I had this moment of happening. Oh, these are all the ways. So part of the way that we can start to train our mind, and I practice this myself still, is, you know, if I'm having a time where I feel like money is tight, I start to pay more attention to all the ways that money is coming into my life, whether that's finding a penny on the ground, or getting a refund from my internet provider when I canceled the service, I go, Oh, look at all the ways that money is coming into my life. Because I am reinforcing that mental pattern and that energy. Like you said, it's not the only thing. I can't just think like, I have a million dollars, I have a million dollars, I have a million dollars, <laughs> and not deal with the stuff that's in there. But at the level of the mind that I can control, focusing on what I do have, feeling grateful for that, feeling how good that feels in my life, really does create a better antenna to bring more of those things in. Awesome. I love it. Okay. I feel like we're coming close to the end and I want to know if you, there's anything that you just want to say to my ladies, whoever's listening in general about life and being a human or. <laughs> <laughs> I love you ladies. You're doing great work. I honor you for really being open and raising your awareness. I want you to know that you are in the right place and things are moving and you can trust your inner guidance that has brought you to this place. It will bring you to the next and the next place. One of the things that I think I want to leave you with is it's also good to create a relationship with enough. It's really important when we're talking about abundance to realize that we have always had enough. Even when we felt like, you know, the numbers in our bank account weren't where we need them to be, or maybe we couldn't pay a bill or we couldn't go on that vacation, that we have always had enough. Because having enough takes us automatically out of scarcity and more along the path towards that deeper part of ourselves to which nothing has ever happened, to which is untouchable, abiding awareness of the heart. So if you can notice, help your mind notice all the ways that you've always had enough, even when it seems like, and the mind's going to bring up some things, well, what about that? Well, what about the house thing? And we lost the house and we did that, but we've always had enough. That will help loosen that fear energy and start to free you up to create the things that your heart's desire are really wanting in life. And we've got some practical tools if you need help getting there. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. It's great. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I feel so grateful for you in my life and just having you bring this Leslie perspective into my group and for my ladies. So thanks. Yay, so much. Thank you. So much fun. Uh, really so much fun to be here and create these things with you. <laughs>